Institute, who will be co-hosting this event with me. This is part of our New York City Russia Public Policy Seminar Series. Uh, this is a series that we've been running now for about five years. It moved fully online, uh, or almost always fully online with the advent of the pandemic. And so we've been doing this largely online uh, since that time. And it is a, approximately during the semesters, it's a kind of a monthly series um, where we try to address pressing public policy issues by bringing together combinations of practitioners and academics, uh, all with expertise in this and insight to trying to do this. Uh, this the, the, the series is jointly sponsored by the Jordan Center at NYU and by the Harriman Institute at Columbia. And as always, we're very grateful to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for providing funding for this, uh, for this series. Um, without further ado, I'd like to join in, and I just want to give a question uh, before we start, just to give a, a quick uh, idea of the logistics of how the panel will proceed. Uh, we have invited four distinguished guests here to talk today about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, what's next for Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, at least we'll be introducing each of them in turn. But the way this is going to unfold is that we've asked each of our guests to speak for approximately 10 minutes or so to give a series of opening statements that they that they have prepared um, on the topic today. After that, we'll turn to a more moderated discussion by me and Elise. You'll have an opportunity to join this discussion by leaving questions in the Q&A uh, feature of the webinar. So if you look down on your Zoom panel, you'll have the Q&A button and you can leave questions there. Uh, Elise and I will then draw from those questions as well as our own questions to put to the panelists. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can leave questions in the comment section on YouTube as well. And we will wrap up uh, by uh, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you all for joining us here today uh, at this next iteration of the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. And I have a great pleasure to pass it over to my colleague, Elise Giuliano. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thanks everybody for coming today. So we have a great set of panelists and I will introduce each of them uh, in turn right now and then we'll get started. So first uh, lead off speaker will be Thomas Duval, who is a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe. He specializes in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus. He's the author of numerous publications about the region, including the Caucasus and Introduction, The Great Catastrophe, Armenians and Turks in the Shadow of Genocide, and the authoritative book on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Black Garden, Armenia, and Azerbaijan through peace and war, uh, something I assigned to my students. From 2010 to 2015, Duval worked for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. And before that, he worked extensively as a journalist in print and for BBC Radio. From 1993 to 97, he worked in Moscow for the Moscow Times, the Times of London, and The Economist, where he specialized in Russian politics and uh, the situation in Chechnya. He's co-authored the book Chechnya Calamity in the Caucasus and that book won an award the James Cameron Prize for Distinguished Reporting. Um, and with that I will uh, turn it over to Tom Duvall. Thank you very much uh, Elise and also thank you Josh. Very glad to be with you and see um, two old friends Anna and Audrey uh, joining us, and also um, Hamad Taba. I'm joining you from from London. So I'll I'll try and as I'm going first, I'll try and make some kind of broader framing remarks about what happened, and and maybe and end with a couple of of more forward looking remarks about what happens next. Um, obviously, what we saw uh, in September was the tragic denouement of, of a conflict, which um, you can date back to. 1988, when the Karabakh Armenians first tried to secede from Soviet Azerbaijan, or you can date it back to the early 20th century. But but what certainly happened was a comprehensive Azerbaijani military victory with the with the full takeover of Nagorno Karabakh. In fact, the ab abolition of an entity called Nagorno Karabakh and the flight of the entire population, well, 99% of the population, around 100,000 people to Armenia um, and, um, you know, a, a tragic denouement because um, a conflict that so many people have tried to, to forge a peaceful and equitable solution to, but, but ultimately was uh, yet again um, an out, the final outcome uh, decided by force. Um, I think it's bad news for a lot of people. Clearly, it's, it's bad news for those who have sought um, Armenia-Azerbaijan reconciliation, Armenian-Azerbaijani reconciliation, um, the, 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 the end of the conflict in this way, um, the 
flight of the Karabakhis from their homeland, um, the loss of this very important place for Armenians um, in general, you know, poisons prospects of reconciliation for uh, another generation, unfortunately. So clearly it's, and, and clearly it's obviously terrible for, for the people of, of Karabakh who are displaced. It's obviously, I think it's bad for Armenia. It, in, in one way, um, Prime Minister Pashinyan is removed of a burden of dealing with the Karabakh conflict, but I think that's outweighed by the fact that he has uh, now a, a kind of coalition arrayed against him of Karabakhis, of, of Russia, and um, we'll obviously talk, I think, quite a lot more about the, the breakdown in Armenia-Russia relations, and, and and with leading diaspora organizations over the loss of Karabakh. So it, it's a source of intra-Armenia uh, Azerbaijan in a different way. Um, the It's a very personal victory for Ilham Aliyev, he visited Stepanaket, um, Shankendi, on October the 15th. And um, if you haven't seen the footage or read the speech, uh, he made it into a very personal, very militaristic victory occasion in which he alone stood in an empty square. He pointed to the building behind him, which had housed the Karabakh Armenian administration. And he talked about it as a personal victory for himself. He was wearing camouflage fatigues. He was later filmed. Uh, a Karabakh Armenian flag. He um, joyfully talked about the fact that the Karabakh Armenian leaders were in detention. Uh, he um, said um, all the uh, Azerbaijani people should be thanking Allah, which implied that um, the Armenians were not uh, included in that category. So it, it, it really, I think, sets a tone for a more personalized, a more militaristic, autocratic um, regime in Azerbaijan, in which opposition, I think, has been silenced um, due to the comprehensive victory um, won by Aliyev. Um, who's responsible for this tragic outcome? Well, I think pretty much everybody. <laughs> um, um, the Armenians themselves um, and the Karabakh Armenians, um, after the fall of uh, Levon Tepetrosyan in 1998, who really tried pushed very hard for, for a solution. Uh, it, there was very much a wait and see status quo uh, posture by the Armenians, in particular the Armenians of Karabakh, supported by quite influential people and, and supported again by leading diaspora organizations that uh, they should just wait for uh, Azerbaijan to capitulate, um, that they would build a new independent state of Artsakh and, and wait for the world to recognize it. Well, the world um, had other ideas um, and obviously Azerbaijan rearmed and, and, and since 2020 has, has uh, reconquered the territories. Um, the Russians uh, certainly played uh, a negative role in the sense that they never really pushed for an agreement or, 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 or one should say that they pushed for an agreement which suited them. Um, but uh, as the, the rather black humor joke goes, who does Russia support in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict? Russia supports the conflict, and I think that was the the the, the case for, for for many many years. Um, and Russia obviously played a, a pivotal role uh, in the September events. In in that, um, having deployed a peacekeeping force, um, the peacekeeping force was stood down, uh, allowing the Azerbaijanis to do this full military takeover. Um, but obviously, um, the West also played a role. I, I I see a kind of vicious circle here in Western diplomacy um, that um, no one in the region really committed themselves fully to a peace process and Western actors therefore never took uh, this peace process uh, fully seriously. They, 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 they engaged more in conflict mitigation and conflict management than in full conflict mediation. And in turn, the lack of Western interest, I think signaled to the con conflict parties um, that it wasn't worth them making big compromises. So, um, you know, um, clearly this is a region still of rather marginal Western interest, but 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 the West also has a responsibility. But clearly the biggest responsibility for what um, just happened um, lies with Azerbaijan, with President Aliyev since 2020. I mean, that's the, the pivotal date when um, Azerbaijan suddenly became the dominant force. 
in the region by its comprehensive military victory. And after that military victory, Azerbaijan definitely had choices. Um, they were, it was constantly urged by Western partners to be magnanimous, to cut a deal with the Karabakh Armenians, often some kind of, of autonomy, to treat Pashinyan um, and Armenia basically as a partner uh, in the South Caucasus, to work together to um, on on communication routes and to reduce Russian influence in the region. That that was the Western pitch, uh, continuously to Baku post twenty twenty. Instead, President Aliyev kept up the anti-Armenian rhetoric. Uh, he didn't respond to the overtures of Nikol Pashinyan, um, for example, recognize the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan with a specific number of eighty-six thousand square kilometers. Uh, Azerbaijan continued to use force, then, as we know, uh, shut down Karabakh uh, since December last year and finally used full military force to take over the region. So this was a, um, a conscious choice by Azerbaijan to keep up the anti-Armenian rhetoric, not to partner with Azerbaijan and, and instead to partner with Russia and to keep, um, by implication, uh, Russian presence strong in Armenia. So we have this rather um, miserable situation. Uh, what next? Well, um, we see, um, we're still hearing talk about the so-called peace agreement. I say so-called because what we're really talking about is not so much peace as normalization of relations between Baku and Yerevan. I'm sure we'll talk about that too. We will still hear predictions that that will be agreed by the end of the year. Uh, but I should remind you that we also had that the same thing in 2022 of predictions that an agreement would be signed by the end of 2022, and that didn't happen either. Um, I'm a bit skeptical. Um, I think um, the issues at stake are still too difficult and trust levels are still too low. We also have the problem of multiple formats. We have an EU-US process, which has been on hold since the, the takeover of Karabakh. Um, and President Aliyev didn't show up in, in Granada to a meeting uh, where he was invited. Um, we have um, still a Russian process with the, the Russians still inviting um, both leaders and foreign ministers to Moscow. And we have a rather vague three plus three format, which is the idea that, uh, that um, Russia, Iran and Turkey um, should sit down with Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan to sort out the region's problems. And there was a meeting uh, last month in Tehran of the three plus three format. Uh, the Georgians didn't show up. I think the Armenians showed up reluctantly. Um, and we should view that process, think, I think, very much as a three plus three minus the West process, um, a kind of an attempt to return the region to kind of traditional great power management by the three neighbors and former um, colonial powers of the region, minus the West, minus any normative framework, something which I think the collective West looks at um, with uh, considerable alarm. But then again, the question is, can the West raise its game to offer something more? Um, a few points to end on the connectivity issue, because this is talked about as a solution. Uh, potentially, it is, I think, uh, the game changer if there can be a deal on transport and connectivity. Um, to open up closed borders and roads. Um, that was the idea in November 2020. Unfortunately, I think what we're seeing, though, is, is a competition of two, uh, basically two connectivity projects. One is the so-called Zangazor Corridor, a kind of um, an Azerbaijani corridor across Armenian territory to its exclave of Nakhchivan and on to Turkey. Uh, and there seems to be a bit of a shared agenda as its kind of route, um, rail route potentially to the south, uh, circumventing um, its closed borders in Europe, and a very much a, a, a route that stops there, stops in Nakhchivan and, and um, has minimal Armenian control. There's an alternative vision, which is that this should be a wider uh, Armenia um, with the Armenia-Turkey border opening and, and becomes um, you know, what's called the middle corridor, a much more international route in which Armenia is 
uh, a full member of, of, of that project. So a competition between those two visions, clearly there are many that many smaller variables here, but I, I, I would basically characterize it as such. And here I do think that um, no one really wants to see a a, a a a project which is dominated by by one project but there are there are several issues here um one of which um is a, a very technical issue but an important one which is that armenian railways um is a russian railways so one can carve out of uh, sanctioned policy in order to um, involve Armenian railways in this kind of international uh, day that the Armenia-Turkey border opens. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss that as well. It, it, it is the day that things will really begin to change here. Um, but a lot more to say, but I think I, I better stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next, we will hear from Anna Ohanyan who is the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College. She's also a non-resident senior scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Russia and Eurasia program. And she's a two-time Fulbright scholar to the South Caucasus. She has authored or co-authored five books, including Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond, Networked Regionalism as Conflict Management, and The Neighborhood Effect, The Imperial Roots of Regional Fracture in Eurasia. She's published articles in nationalities papers, communist and post-communist studies, and international studies review, among other journals. Professor Ohanyan has also served as a doctoral fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and has consulted for numerous organizations, including the UN Foundation, the World Bank, the National Intelligence Council Project, Department of State, the Carter Center, and USAID. Anna? Thank you very much um, for the introduction, Elise, and um, for organizing this panel. Um, I'll be, I wish the circumstances were different, and I do stand before you as a defeated scholar. Um, as I have been observing the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict from the perspective of peace science, but also from the perspective of security studies and what transpired in terms of the fall of the Nagorno-Karabakh as an entity actually belies to what the prescriptions of sustainable peace building um, uh, research studies have shown, have been prescribing over the years. I've been looking at this conflict from the comparative, comparative historical context, and it is in this context that I will try to answer the question as to what happened, largely piggybacking what um, Tom has already said. Um, but I do think it is important to place the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh in the context of over 50 similar conflicts that are active per year on average uh, over the past decade. So what happened? Uh, the specific ways in which conflicts end matter. They matter for the minorities. They matter for the victorious state. They matter for the people who live in victorious state and for the regional neighborhood in general. Forms of conflict management, patterns of conflict diplomacy are powerful levers of order building or fracture in a particular region. Um, as I've been looking at this conflict, in terms of how conflicts end, there is a really growing literature on the liberal conflict management. It's the scholarship has been kind of talking about this continuum of conflicts ending uh, through liberal forms of resolution, meaning respect for minorities, transparency, sustainability, economic development, uh, civil societies included. And on the other hand, they're illiberal uh, forms of conflict management with non-victory somewhere in the middle. The liberal outcomes tend to end with negotiated settlements and Wallerstein's quality peace here, defined by security, transparency, and predictability for the victim being an important measure. So examples of liberal ends of conflict is the Eastern Slavonia in Croatia, Namibia's independence from South Africa, um, number of conflicts ending peacefully through negotiated settlements, had increased from 14% to 40% in the twi from the twilight years of the Cold War up until the mid-2010s. 20, mid, uh, 
This is not clearly what transpired in Nagorno-Karabakh. The illiberal outcome, the victor's peace, these are conflicts that end with war uh, and militarization, total domination of the, by, the, of, by the victorious party. Um, an example of these types of endings are Angola's militarized end of its decade-long civil war, Sri Lanka's victor's peace over Tamils, Russia's victory over Chechnya, Ethiopia's victory over Tigray, and um, uh, and I have actually have written an article in international negotiation titled Illiberal Peace, Oxymoron um, uh, or a Political Necessity, where I argue that Nagorno-Karabakh is also falls in this pattern. And Lawrence Grower just published a very important article in the World Politics Journal, arguing that this is a classic, a, a classic case, textbook case of authoritarian conflict management. Um, I strongly recommend Lawrence's article, but I do disagree both with uh, Lawrence's point that this is a authoritarian conflict management, as well as with myself, actually, that article that this is in the liberal end. The article that I wrote was before the hung, before the siege, before the militarized attack. So what I'm arguing is that uh, the, the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh does not fall on this spectrum at all. And that this is really worrisome for those of us thinking and researching about conflict management in the 21st century uh, in the context of great power rivalries. So the end of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, if we could call it at that, does not conform to none of these outcomes, not even to Victor's peace, simply because this conflict ended with an ethnic cleansing, with one of the conflict parties forced out of its indigenous presence. Um, but much more important, uh, I would argue, at least for my research, is that it resulted in institutional obliteration as an outcome consequential for long-term peace building. So it does demonstrate the possibility of at conflicts ending through an ethnic cleansing. And in this respect, um, implications of this particular ending are going to are, uh, will be quite specific for uh, both only for domestic stability in both countries, obviously the victim community, but also the regional neighborhood. Um, in terms of how was this outcome uh, possible politically? And this is where security perspective, security studies is really helpful rather than the peace studies. Um, in terms of, so this was essentially, there is a hybridity of conditions on the ground, meaning there is a military attack on the entity, but it was a culmination of nearly year long humanitarian blockade of the entity. And this viewing the two outcomes together is crucial. Peace processes, and this is where I uh, feel uh, very, very worst as a researcher, it becomes very difficult to see, to understand how peace processes were sabotaged in this case and used as a tool to legitimize coercion and sporadic military attacks on the ground, attacks on the villages, intimidation of the residents through loudspeakers to leave their villages. So I, I looking, observing this, um, especially the blockade, it became clear that once peace process is someone else's hybrid war. The blockade was used as a non-kinetic use of force, which we gently describe as coercive diplomacy. Um, and it was used um, using the peace processes to legitimize as a legitimizing tool for that violence. Massive political attack on the entity would have been costly for Aliyev. And instead, this hybrid warfare condition was used. Mm -hmm. And as such, that was politically cheaper for Aliyev um, as he was able to uh, avoid a total war. The diplomacy of so-called of sword and quill was used, control level of violence and victims, ambiguity in the application of international law, the rise of third party actors with dubious commitments to liberal norms of conflict management, Tom mentioned forum shopping, but this also reflects the broader fragmentation of conflict management, global conflict management infrastructure. Welcome to the multipolar world order, really. Um, much of this took place with Russia's blessing and tacit bargaining with Azerbaijan behind the scenes, uh, which in Azerbaijan, and Audrey has way more expertise on this, laundering Russian money to European, mar I'm sorry, Russian oil for European markets, deep authoritarian coordination that is taking place place in the context of the Eurasian continent. Cooley Nexon work here on Exit from Hegemony book is really consequential. So uh, with this, I think those are some of the points to chart here. 
um, the fall of the Nagorno-Karabakh and its regional prospects for peace. In terms of the short-term implications, I agree with um, uh, Tom's analysis, uh, but I think the the because the conflict ended with an ethnic cleansing, it does essentially it's a crime against humanity that pushes, that creates possibilities, I don't know, legal possibilities, pursuing either just peace, meaning um, for either a human rights perspective, whether that will be advanced as a possible track, which I do not think politically right now is possible, but it will be pursued or not. I don't, we could talk about this. Um, the second possible outcome is practical coexistence and um, a variety of uh, everything else in between, uh, non-war as an outcome. But I am also, I think, the uh, the possibility, hoping, pinning hopes that there is going to be this P comprehensive peace agreement um, and negotiated and it will trickle down into the region. I remain skeptical simply because there is no um, institutional infrastructure to support any peace agreement, not that I know of, um, and civil society is not engaged. And there's massive, uh, uh, obvious the suppression of civil society inside Azerbaijan, which would be the actor to carry this out if Azerbaijan was serious about peace building. Um, I would argue that regional stability uh, is more important at this point uh, than peace agreement, uh, um, simply because it would create the necessary political space for social peace to be nurtured, to, to be encouraged down the road. Long-term implications, I think, are um, very, very equally significant. And I want to thank Anpon for his nudge to me to situate what's transpired in the context of, of my research. And I'll just simply say a few words here. The imperial legacies in various sub-regions around Russia, pre-Soviet legacies, have been shaping the contemporary dynamics of armed conflicts. I have uh, tried to show this in my last book, In the Neighborhood Effect, where I've studied the Habsburg Ottoman Russian empires and their select peripheries, imperial peripheries, where I've argued that um, those imperial peripheries, they were endowed with civic connectivity and the modicum of representative institutions at the time where cross-conflict civic groups converged and bargained have been more effective in managing geopolitical rivalry in their neighborhoods over time. One more point on this, uh, my comparative historical analysis of those several imperial peripheries in the three empires have also shown that regions pacify over time when there is civic depth and the modicum of political space for these political groups to connect. Imperial peripheries with such patterns of connectivity have been better positioned to create strong states and managed armed conflict after the end of the Cold War. Viewed when in this framework, the fall of the Nagorno-Karabakh administrative unit, as well as the ethnic cleansing that it prompted, with persistent lack of civil society inside Azerbaijan, consolidated regional fractures in the South Caucasus, and it is continuing enabling geopolitical rivalry, um, which partly is the result of that poor connectivity. Regional fractures fuel illiberalism in order building. Um, the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh signifies a highly illiberal end to a conflict, which will set to deepen authoritarianism inside Azerbaijan. And there's a lot of research that demonstrates this, that conflicts that do end uh, with militarized victory end up deepening authoritarianism in the victorious state. And they, as a result, they make a country much more dependent on external patrons, such as Russia and Turkey for regime survival. Uh, Mitchell Orenstein's work, Land in Between, is a really useful resource to understand Aliyev's maneuvering. Uh, Belarus is a similar example. Uh, I'll, I'll bet Aliyev has a lot more room to maneuver because of the petrol resources, I'll bet declining. In terms of prospects for regional stability, uh, when looking at Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, I do, I'm a, uh, I'm a very stubborn institutionalist. Um, I do argue that region types do matter. Um, as they shape incentives for war and peace. And the causes of this conflict, some of which I argue in my book predate the Soviet Union, imperial legacies reverberate, but the drivers of this conflict, even in the modern, uh, in the most modern state since the 80s, are different from the contemporary drivers of the conflict. The continuing need for rivalry for Aliyev regime survival is really crucial. In comparative um, studies of uh, regime types, 
that are in conflict, Armenia, Azerbaijan are described as a dangerous dyad, meaning you have one is a nascent democracy, one is also an authoritarian state, and these dyads are particularly destabilizing. In this case, it's not only that you uh, uh, Azerbaijan is an authoritarian actor, but it, is a, it has a personalized petrotocracy with oil dependency and rapidly declining reserves. Uh, these types of states, the research shows, are more likely to start wars. Opening borders uh, is contrary, I would argue, to uh, Aliyev's interests and his domestic governance trajectories and choices thus far. His governance has been too centralized. I do think that opening borders, rules-based within South Caucasus, would uh, generate huge economic dividends, not just for Armenians, but also for, for, uh, for the Azerbaijanis, particularly concerning that Azerbaijan as a state is facing the green transition. Uh, but I do think the peace processes do not distinguish between the interests of the regime versus the interests of the society at large. The logic of corridors as opposed to regional openness um, is favored by uh, President Aliyev, which in his, uh, again, uh, which again is not in the interest of Azerbaijan state, I would argue. In terms of the quote unquote uh, Zion yeah, yeah. 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 I just I just want to let you know you're at about 12 minutes now. Okay, very good. So I will stop here. Um, simply, I'll just say in regards to the Zangezer Corridor, I just published a piece in Foreign Policy where I do go into great detail on this, simply to say that the region actually is hugely significant. Um, Armenia South, their territorial integrity uh, to the prospects of Eurasian connectivity on the terms of the liberal order. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now we will hear from Audrey Alstadt, who is Professor of History at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. <clears throat> She's the author of The Politics of Culture in Soviet Azerbaijan, 1920 to 1940, The Azerbaijani Turks, Power and Identity Under Russian Rule, and Frustrated Democracy in Post-Soviet Azerbaijan. Her current book project is first in The American Diplomats Who Opened Embassies in New Post-Soviet States, 1992. Interesting. She has written dozens of articles on the politics, culture, and history of Azerbaijan, published in the U.S., the U.K., France, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. Professor Alstadt holds a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago and an honorary doctorate from Khazar University in Baku in Azerbaijan. She has been a recipient of various grants, including the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, grants from Harvard Russian Research Center, and the U.S. Institute of Peace. She's been a consultant for Freedom House, Oxford Analytica, Radio Liberty, U.S. Department of Justice, Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. State Department, the Commission for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and other agencies. Audrey? Thanks very much, Elisa. It's good to see all of you. And, and I wanna thank NYU and the Harriman Institute um, and of course, Josh and Anton for their work on this. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Recently, a journalist uh, asked me for an interview uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh going all the way back, she said, to 2020. Um, I declined this invitation. Um, but the request alerted me to the lack of historical perspective on this issue, like so many others. The Soviet Union is long gone. And so to many people, and especially those who are new to studying this problem, all of the Soviet policies which contributed significantly to this particular conflict in mountainous Karabakh, like others, are ignored, uh, if not completely forgotten. Um, also not mentioned in, in much detail sometimes um, and its significance is precisely this war of 1988 to 94 that, that we've all just mentioned, but, but then we've been doing this a long time. And that fighting, of course, spanned the end of the Soviet period and the beginning of post-Soviet independence of both Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is what's usually called, in retrospect, the first Karabakh War. Um, as I try to fill these gaps, um, I'd like to really focus on the 1988 to 94 period, not the events so much as to what the implications were in Azerbaijan. That's the place I've been studying um, all of my adult life, and I spent quite a bit of time there. Um, 
during this time period, uh, as Tom mentioned in in his um, his own comments, uh, it was Armenian forces, uh, some from Nagorno-Karabakh, um, some from the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic, later independent Armenia, and some from the diaspora um, in Europe, North America, and the Middle East, who successfully took control of the coveted um, Soviet-era Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, or region, of the Soviet Union, which was created by Soviet authorities in the early 1920s. The Armenian forces also then, um, in the years of this fighting, took control of the land between the old Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region and um, the Armenian border, also a swath of land south to the Iranian border, and then a small, smaller segment of land um, on the east side in the direction of Baku. So that by 1994, Armenian forces had occupied 14% of Azerbaijan's territory. The Ar Azerbaijani forces, such as they were at that time, were completely defeated. All of the sources that I've seen, um, and I followed this closely, while it was unfolding uh, from the late 80s onward, the sources that I've seen seem to indicate that Azerbaijan lost the largest number of fighters and had the largest number of killed, wounded, and displaced civilians. Azerbaijan not only lost territory on the battlefield, not only had tens of thousands of displaced um, and, and more tens of thousands wounded, but Azerbaijan was completely humiliated on the global scale. The 1994 ceasefire was necessary to stop the bleeding, both literal and figurative. Since that time, every Azerbaijani political party on the spectrum and individuals, everybody I've heard of or known, want only to take back that land to restore Azerbaijanis to their homes of that time period and to restore national dignity lost in that war. Tom, in his comments, commented that um, Ilham Aliyev's recent speeches suggest a personal victory in Azerbaijan. Um, and I would agree. Um, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that the losses of the late 80s and early 90s, the loss and the humiliation was also deeply personal. And so this is something that has really captured um, Azerbaijan. As a second aspect, the Western press and international human rights groups in that time period of the late 80s to early 90s <clears throat> only belatedly began to pay attention to the eviction of Azerbaijanis from the mountainous Karabakh and all the regions around it. There was little, if any, outcry about the suffering of those IDPs, nor was there aid to Azerbaijan to help to help the country, which was then quite poor, as were all of the post-Soviet states, certainly in this region. Um, no aid there to assist with resettlement or medical care or housing or anything for those um, IDPs. Now, Azerbaijanis at the time felt that the West aligned itself with the Armenians as Christians and suspected and disliked them, the Azerbaijanis, because they were Muslim, although quite secular. Some people shrugged this off. What can you expect? This is, this is the way the world works. And others were very bitter about it. The bitterness and the conflict stem from conflicting claims to the mountainous Karabakh and the adjacent regions as well. Um, the national movements of the 19th century of both groups um, claimed virtually all of this territory. And when they were independent from 1918 to 20, uh, both of them attempted to draw borders and to have borders recognized in such a way that all of these essentially maximalist or close to maximalist claims were recognized. In the end, in 1920, when both of them came under Soviet rule, this now became, in a sense, the problem of the Communist Party and of Moscow. And the committees dealing with these included Georgian um, and Armenian communists, and Stalin was often in some of these meetings. In the end, although this is a complicated, long process, Nakhchivan went to um, Azerbaijan, Zengizur to Armenia, and 
Nagorno Karabakh in, in in from the earliest things I wrote back in 88, 89, I called it an apple of discord. And I think that it is, and I think that it was meant to be. The territory was put inside of Azerbaijan, but a border was drawn around it to indicate an autonomous region that would have cultural autonomy and extensive self-rule. Both the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians found this to be objectionable. And um, the status, the special status annoyed the Azerbaijanis and the fact that it was not in Armenia annoyed the Armenians. So the change of that war of 1988 to 94 achieved a key Armenian aim, which was to retake Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and now Azerbaijan became the disgruntled party. And so I think that its efforts to retake it were really predictable. There was no chance they were going to make a move in 1994 or really any time in the 90s at all. But they were just going to wait. Azerbaijan, as an independent state, has pretty crucial strengths. It has a larger population than Armenia and a higher birth rate, a higher population growth. It has an alliance with Turkey that ended up training its um, its military and, of course, selling lots of weapon systems. It cultivated an alliance with Israel, which also sold weapon systems. And Azerbaijan had the oil and gas resources to pay for all of this. By about 2012, Azerbaijan's military budget equaled Armenia's entire state budget. Baku was going to move against the Armenian-held territory and was building up the means to do so. It was also exceedingly important to the government of Ilham Aliyev because as he became a more authoritarian ruler, he wanted to leg legitimize that authoritarianism and silence his critics, especially domestically. When Azerbaijan lost, launched its offensive in 2020, and again, this fall of 2023, Western states raised a cry again about the eviction of Armenians and of ethnic cleansing. And once again, the Azerbaijanis, although nobody said this, but they said internally, they said to one another, you know, where were these voices when our people were being ethnic cleansed, when we were being evicted, etc.? I do not mean this as an excuse for Azerbaijani actions in any way. Because, you know, Tom's pointed out um, all of the things that have been happening. Um, Anna has pointed out, you know, uh, a systematic analysis of these events. But I raise the issue because I think Westerners need to be aware of it, that it's a, a, a sore point in Azerbaijan, rhetorically, but also politically. And conferences like this and governments and international organizations raise human rights considerations as they should, as they must. At the same time, they need to realize that the Azerbaijani government has had an appalling human rights record domestically, that it has failed in even its most sincere sounding promises to uphold human rights and to build democracy throughout its um, history as an independent state. And I would say most of all under Ilham Aliyev in the 21st century. Nonetheless, the United States, the EU, other countries have continued to do business with it and have put these issues of democracy building and human rights on a back burner. Now, some Azerbaijanis will say, Western governments just care more about the repression of Armenians than they do about the, the repression of Azerbaijani regime critics, human rights activists, and journalists inside Azerbaijan. It is an old refrain. Again, this is not to excuse Azerbaijan, but I am glad to see, because I'm glad to see issues about human rights being raised in any venue. But Westerners need to understand that they will be accused of holding a double standard. Um, the same regime can be repressive, but when its victims are its own citizens, other Azerbaijanis, fellow Muslims, the criticism will be brief um, and it will take a backseat to cooperation for business, energy, 
military cooperation, et cetera. And they will be accused of a double standard. As for what's next, um, I don't know what's next. But I do think that this immensely strengthens Ilham Aliyev and his rule. Um, the few voices that had emerged against warfare and in favor of peace, um, most of those people, I believe, are already in jail in Azerbaijan. The movement against them was very swift. Azerbaijan is holding a very strong hand, so to speak, and is not vulnerable to all of the sorts of criticism and pressures that the human rights community or the diplomatic community might wish that they were, um, because they have oil and natural gas. Europe still wants and needs it, as do others. Moreover, their immediate regional, the immediate regional powers, the neighbors of Russia, Iran, Turkey, care much more about what happens in the South Caucasus than farther removed countries, including the United States. Connectivity, if that can be developed, is, I think, a very important issue in order um, to move ahead and possibly peacefully, uh, again, a deal on railroad or, or road transportation and pipelines. But I think that would only work within a firm peace treaty that assured the territorial integrity of Armenia as well as um, all of the other parties. Um, I'm very eager to hear what others um, have to say, and I hope we can expand some of these discussions um, in the question period. Thanks. Thank you, Audrey. And now we will hear from our final speaker, Mohammed Tabar. He is an associate professor in the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School. His research areas include international security and Middle East politics. He's the author of Religious Statecraft, The Politics of Islam in Iran. Dr. Tabar has been a fellow or a visiting scholar at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, Harvard University's Center for the Middle East, Cambridge University's Center of Islamic Studies, and George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies. His articles have appeared in Security Studies, PS, Political Science and Politics, Journal of Strategic Studies, and Political Science Quarterly. Dr. Tabar is currently working on two research projects, one on nuclear statecraft and hybrid regimes, and the other on Marxist armed organizations in Iran. He has a PhD in government from Georgetown University. Mohammed. Yes, um, thank you, Elise and, and uh, Josh for the introduction and also for the invitation. I'm very pleased and honored to be here on this panel. Um, um, let me just say at the outset that I look at the region through the prism of um, Iran's foreign policy and the Middle East uh, conflict. And I like to make two points. Uh, the first one is that the South Caucasus uh, has become increasingly vital to Iran's uh, national security, which means that uh, we are going to see Tehran playing a much more assertive role in the region than it has uh, traditionally played in the past. And, th and this has a lot to do, which is my second point, um, with the conflict between um, Iran and Israel. As it was previously mentioned, uh, is uh, Azerbaijan has good ties with, with Israel, and this is something that Iran is very concerned. There's also another element, which is Iran's fear of NATO coming to its backyard uh, through Turkey and Azerbaijan or through Armenia. So let me start by providing an overview of how Iran perceives the region and how its threat perception has changed in recent years. Iran has tried to strike a balance between Azerbaijan and Armenia since the 90s when the two states uh, became independent, but primarily and quietly backed Armenia. And this has often been seen as a strange partnership because here you have the Islamic Republic of Iran supporting um, Armenia, which is a Christian nation, against Azerbaijan, which is a Shia state. At the same time, Israel has become a strong ally of Azerbaijan. And also keep in mind that uh, Iran and Azerbaijan have um, affinities beyond their religious ties. Iran has a significant Azeri population. In fact, there are far more Azeris living in Iran than they are in Azerbaijan. About 20% of Iranians, between 15 to 20 millions, 
um, Azeris live in Iran, and Iran's supreme leader has an Azeri origin. His father was an Azeri in Iran. So this partly explains why Iran has been cautious in its support uh, for Armenia because of its Azeri population. It's been, it's been trying to adopt a publicly neutral position. But of course, behind the scene, it was mostly behind Armenia. But Iran has become increasingly concerned over Israel's presence in Azerbaijan. Um, the reports that Israel has used Azerbaijan's territory to conduct surveillance and other operations inside Iran, including stealing Iran's nuclear five and perhaps even assassinating Iran's nuclear scientists. Uh, of course, Azerbaijan has denied these reports that uh, Israel has used its territory. Uh, but there is no question that Israel and Azerbaijan are very close. They have a, a strategic partnership. Azerbaijan uh, recently opened its embassy in Tel Aviv, becoming the first Shia majority nation with an embassy in Israel. Uh, and as you all remember, um, last January, when there was a, a gunman in Tehran uh, going into the uh, embassy of Azerbaijan and killing uh, uh, a couple of people there, after that, Azerbaijan uh, shut down its embassy in Tehran and it, ha it hasn't opened it yet. So, um, and again, as it was previously mentioned, Israel buys um, um, about, um, I've seen different figures, 40% of its oil from Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan uh, gets up to 70% of its arms from Israel. Um, and as one Israeli official, official, I think it was maybe former Foreign Minister Lieberman, who said Azerbaijan is more important for Israel than France uh, is. Um, and the reason is just this is basically Iran. Just as Iran has a presence in Lebanon, north of Israel, through Hezbollah, Israel is allying with Iran's northern neighbor, uh, which is Azerbaijan. Um, and this strong partnership has been uh, essential for Azerbaijan to win uh, the 2020 war against Armenia. But this was also a wake up call uh, for Iran about the role of uh, the influence of Israel in Azerbaijan. So on the one hand, Iran has publicly backed Azerbaijan's uh, recent victory to capture uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, saying that the area belongs to Azerbaijan. But on the other hand, it's deeply concerned that this victory is emboldening President Aliyev, who could launch military operations further inside Armenia. Um, and uh, I think it was Tom that who mentioned the issue of Zangezur corridor earlier today. So this is this is a major concern to Iran because Azerbaijan is trying to establish a sovereign corridor through Armenia to Nakhchivan uh, through the Zangezur corridor, which would basically separate Iran from Armenia. And Armenia matters to Iran for various reasons, including access to Europe and also the reports that Iran is using Armenia to, Ar Armenia to circumvent US sanctions. Um, and Iranian leaders, uh, including the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, have been very clear that they consider the border with Armenia a red line, that it cannot be changed. Um, and they will not tolerate any changes in the internationally recognized borders in the region. And in, uh, in the past year or two, Iranian army and the Revolutionary Guards both have conducted several military drills in the area, and they have even exercised and practiced how to cross the Aras River and go into Azerbaijan. Um, so the tensions have subsided in the past couple of weeks and months after Iran and Azerbaijan agreed um, on another route that will uh, that would connect Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan through Iran. Um, they're building roads and bridges and making a lot of diplomatic gestures toward, towards each other. But there's also a lot of mistrust between the two. So ultimately, it seems that Iran is, is very fearful that President Aliyev and President Erdogan have not given up on the Zangezur corridor. And at any moment, uh, Azerbaijan could uh, suddenly invade Armenia in the south and occupy that area and disconnect Iran from Armenia. Um, so 
there's a lot of concern on that front. But to make matters worse, Iran also sees Armenia under Prime Minister Pashinyan shifting away from our Iran and Russia uh, uh, towards US and, and, and Europe. And this would invite NATO to the region at the expense of Iran and Russia for that matter. Um, there have been reports that Iran even, uh, Iran tried to reach out to Armenia and uh, tried to even station some observers along the border uh, to prevent an attack from Azerbaijan, but the Armenian government uh, has not agreed so far. Um, instead, Armenia has conducted joint mil military drills with the US and is strengthening uh, military ties with France and other European countries. Um, and US official, I think it was Yuri Kim a few months ago, um, uh, giving a statement on the Hill, uh, who said that the US, uh, basically this is a strategic opportunity for the United States to undermine the influence that Iran, Russia, and China have in the South Caucasus. Um, and this makes Iran much more concerned about what is happening in the region. Um, and Iran has warned Armenia and uh, more importantly, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, that it does not tolerate uh, external forces uh, in the region. And it, it would like to resolve the issues through the three plus three formula. Um, the revolutionary guards in the past few months, uh, some of the uh, me social media outlets that have been loosely affiliated with the revolutionary guards, they have uh, released a lot of provocative videos that show Iran's uh, military drills, its missile and drone capabilities. And basically they're signaling that Iran is ready to go in and stop Azerbaijan from occupying south of um, Armenia and, and establishing the Zangezu uh, uh, corridor. So as far as Iran is concerned, um, the region remains very volatile. And unlike the past when Iran was not very active in the region, this time around, they seem that they're ready to react pretty quickly because they don't want, as I said, access to Armenia and to Russia. And as I mentioned, there's also the issue of um, uh, how they use Armenia to circumvent US, US sanctions. And they're also hoping that if there is a change um, in the Armenian government at some point, uh, so they can strengthen the relationship again and could establish it, again another uh, alliance with Russia uh, um, and possibly even bringing China. So these are the reports that you keep hearing from the Iranian media that uh, that this is about, not just about uh, Azerbaijan, this is also about NATO coming to the region. It's also about Israel and it's, uh, and it's going to at the expense of Iran, Russia and China. And, and as I said, I was, pleased, I was really surprised that even US officials publicly stated that. So let me stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thanks to all of our panelists for those great presentations. I want to remind um, the people in the audience that we, you can add questions if you're on the webinar in the Q&A. If you're on YouTube, you can add questions in the chat as well. I'm going to take this opportunity to sort of pull the camera lens back a little bit and ask a general question, which I would welcome answers from any of our panelists to kick off discussion, which is in the aftermath of the outbreak of conflict in the Middle East, um, there has been a series of uh, musings, I would say, among, you know, discussions in the press about how we are witnessing the end of the sort of Pax Americana and moving into more of a multipolar order. And that part of the characteristics of multipolar orders is more regional, more wars. And the argument for why you get more wars generally is that you lack the, the sort of framework that of the, of the, of a unipolar world or even a, a, a bipolar world where you have these strong powers that are able to deter other actors. And in particularly, the argument here is that the US for 30 years after the Cold War was so powerful that it was able to deter action in a lot of cases, resulting in, and the data is very clear on this, resulting in just many, many fewer um, cross-country wars during the 30 years following the end of the Cold War than we had seen in you know, the previous century. My question for you is, I've seen what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh raised as one of the examples of this here. And so as experts on what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh, I'm super interested in getting your take on this. Is this something that happens in 2023 
and in 2020 and in this these last couple of years, precisely because we've hit the point where the U.S. can no longer deter action um, in a way that it, it previously did because it now faces a rising China, because it faces this sort of more multipolar emerging world. Um, but secondly, one of the questions that's been brought up in regard to this has to do as well with Russia and Russia's role in deterring conflict in the in the area. And so I'm quite interested in your take on whether you think that the fact that Azer, what Azer, you know, the Azerbaijani attack against Nagorno-Karabakh was in part a function of Russia also being distracted by many things that are going on, and particularly by the war in Ukraine. And so it was seen as an opportunity where you know Azerbaijan could move because Russia, as we saw, the peacekeepers stood down. Is that an incorrect interpretation? Is it more that Russia acqui you know, is so is this idea that Russia maybe this wasn't in Russia's interest, but it acquiesced because it didn't have the capacity to deter uh that it had had previously? Or was it more a story that, you know, Russia being, you know, Russia actually not caring anymore for other reasons? And this story about the sort of more likely to see localized conflict because larger powers are less likely to be invested in preventing it is is not correct in this particular case. So any any sort of take on that, I'm trying to understand how Nagorno-Karabakh fits into these larger these larger arguments. Yes, Anna, you want to start? I'll get the ball rolling. That is a that is a very important question, Josh. And um, I, I think about different, I, I'm actually a little bit more confused, but I'll tell you as to why I'm, uh, it, it's very difficult to kind of come at it in one way. On the one hand, in the context of East Asia, actually, I'm forgetting the name of the scholar who argued that this argument that it's the US that has been keeping the Asian peace, he has challenged against it, saying that the Asian peace for the past several decades has su survived and sustained itself because the regional states were able to make the deals to create regional organizations, ASEAN in particular. Uh, in that respect, obviously, this is South Caucasus is a very different region than the East Asia, than East Asia, but at the same time, on the one hand, the importance U.S. sort of exit from hegemony, the rise of multipolarity obviously creates instabilities. There is vacuum. But at the same time, I over the past um, several years and looking at this, I'm increasingly uh, skeptical that it's the uh, great powers are the ones that are providing order. On the contrary, great power rivalry is becoming is a destabilizing factor. And the great power trickle down approach also underestimates the local agency of these states. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, oil is really a significant factor, a prism through which to look at this dynamics now. In 2016, when Azerbaijan, uh, again, there was a four day war, that decline, that war corresponded with the decline of the oil prices. And the same, I'm not saying that it was the oil as to why the 2020 attack happened. There are a variety of other factors, but I think there are local drivers that are uh, that are uh, that are important to consider. In in the context and in my neighborhood effect book, I try to engage with this question: How do regions pacify? And obviously, geopolitical factors are co-constituting with the local uh, uh, factions. And uh, but I do think. Um, the 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 uh, simply ex assuming that it's the U.S. pullout that that's why it's uh, kind of creates this eruption of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Um, obviously, if U.S. was involved, if there was firmer, stronger support for liberal approaches to solving the conflict, the OSC misgroup. Um, was not deep enough. It regularly was being criticized by Aliyev, but criticized for the wrong reasons. He sabotaged all the peace processes uh, over the years. So I think the need for beefing up peace processes was needed. And that's where uh, the U.S. attention, the decline of U.S. attention is problematic. In terms of Russia decline argument, and I'll stop here, um, I don't, Russia is reconstituting. Again, Lawrence Bors has uh, uh, written a really interesting piece, very important piece on this as to how Russia is, uh, I'm forgetting the term, uh, stake building, meaning Russia is not looking at Nagorno-Karabakh in territorial terms anymore in South Caucasus because it's realizing it is weakened in a way 
that it cannot maintain its physical presence there. But at the same time, it's regrouping, reconstituting its connections um, through all kinds of networks. Corruption remains a factor. Uh, but of course, Russia is in the process of new imperial, of imperial decline, very slow decline. And the only response in managing Russia's uh, decline is through strengthening the states. And states strengthen through democratization. I hate to sound... Uh, like a, uh, a diehard liberal here, but I do think that the value of strong, legitimate governance, governments, uh, publicly legitimate governments, is a really important resource in generating stakeholders for peace and security and building security from the bottom up. Thank you. Uh, Thomas? Yeah, can I jump in? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the challenge here is that the South Caucasus is, is kind of three regions, possibly more in one. It's it's kind of part of a European space, um, and maybe in which um, OSC, you know, w was attempting to 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 resolve this conflict. Um, it's also part of a, a kind of Russian neighborhood in which Russia was was seeking to be the dominant power, and it, and as Mohammed has set out for us, it's also increasingly part of a kind of Middle East dynamics as well. We could even add, you know, uh, India-Pakistan rivalry now, now extending to Armenia, Azerbaijan. So it makes it hard to kind of fit into one category or the other. And I think we're seeing two simultaneous processes here. One is a kind of Russia kind of downgrading its role in order to stay in the game and, and giving up on Karabakh in the name of um, keeping its roots to the south open, which means it partners with Azerbaijan. And there's a lot of, uh, a very thick relationship between Russia and Azerbaijan, which I don't think people in the West are sufficiently noticing. It's all about trade. It's about um, oil and gas. It's about R Russia having lost its access to the West, moving south or and, and identifying Azerbaijan as its link to the south. And it's about this kind of managed rivalry, I forget whose term this was, between uh, Russia and Turkey, which, where they kind of, uh, you know, manage their differences in the South Caucasus and also have a shared agenda. And that shared agenda is very much about keeping the West out. And simultaneously, we've still got, um, we've actually got the EU. I'm sitting in London, so no longer in the EU, but 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 not far away. The EU actually upping its game in the South Caucasus, being the, being the more important Western player now than than the US. And and we should mention today that um, the EU just gave Georgia candidate status. Um, celebrations on the streets of Tbilisi tonight, with many caveats, but this is a huge step. So so um, the EU. Um, in Georgia and Armenians welcoming that because that the, they they see that that the closer Georgia moves towards the EU, the more they can they can kind of cling to the Georgians' hotels. Thanks. Okay, okay. Elise, um, Elise. Yeah, you want to go? Yeah. Um, okay. So I think I'll, I'm just gonna. Some of the questions have been addressed, maybe not directly, but in some ways, and I'm gonna try to combine. Um, a series of questions by Christina Dajurian uh, about um, the, is there any role for the UN to play here? And she's kind of asking about um, these developments in light of what's happening in Gaza and the conflict, um, the war of Israel against Gaza, um, and you know whether the kind of um, response to that has any implications for the response of the UN or of the um, West in general to um, try to protect civilians or um, the larger issue um, of, of um, what some people would label a genocide, although we know that's a, um, um, a what some people would, and she is labeling in her question, a genocide um, by Azerbaijan of Armenians. So um, if anybody wants to take up that pretty complex issue, um, how they kind of see the, the human rights protections of victims of this latest war. Um, and the international reaction to that in light of what's going on in Gaza. Yes, go ahead, Audrey. Um, I'm, I'm not going to exactly address it in, in the way it was stated, but, but I would say two things. One is that I think that the United Nations right now is pretty much maxed out 
in terms of where it can deploy sources. And I'm sorry to say, um, I think that his prestige has really declined in, over in recent years. Um, and this might be an, an area where they might decline to, to get involved. I'd also say that if um, both Azerbaijan and Armenia have to agree to their presence, um, Aliyev would probably disagree. Uh, in other words, would not welcome UN presence. Um, and I think one of the, and the second thing that I would say here is that um, as I ended in my remarks, uh, Azerbaijan feels like it's just got a very strong hand right now. They don't really have to agree to anything and they do not have to agree to pressures or any of these other suggestions. Um, it does lead me to make one final comment that I was thinking about from the time Tom started um, and through a couple of other things. Um, the idea that the Minsk group or the Westerners didn't really take the Minsk group mediation and so on seriously, I think the foreign diplomats who were involved in it would disagree with that characterization. I interviewed um, a number of American diplomats for my ongoing project, and many of them happened to go from embassies in the South Caucasus to the Minsk group or, you know, back and forth. And their belief is they thought of everything, they tried everything they could possibly think of, as did the French and Russian um, delegates. Um, and it was really the unwillingness or the un inability of the major parties to compromise that stopped all of this process in, in the either in the end or in the beginning. Um, and for Azerbaijan, I think that they were just waiting to increase their advantages and for the timing to be right for them. And for Armenia, I don't know that case as well, but I think that it was there was much more controversy and much more internal discussion. And paradoxically, um, this, this growing, burgeoning democracy in Armenia um, led to more disputes about domestic politics that when you're running an authoritarian regime like the Azerbaijanis, um, you don't have to deal with that kind of internal dissent. And it's easier to just move ahead. This is not a defense of authoritarian regimes, by the way. Um, but in this particular instance, I think that that um, actually worked in their favor. Thanks so much, Audrey. Uh, Mohammed, there's a few, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A that are getting at the question of the impact of the uh, the conflict that's broken out in the last month in Israel and Gaza, um, and how that may play in here. So, given you know, in particular around what's been what you were discussing here about Iran's relationship with uh, with Armenia and and Ar Azerbaijan's relationship with Israel. Do you foresee any of this being upended at all by what's going on in the in 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 Israel and Gaza right now, either in the short term or in the medium or more longer term? Is there a possibility for some sort of more fundamental realignment here, or are the interests so deeply entrenched at this point that we're more likely to see a lot of hand waving, but not things changing much fundamentally? Absolutely, I think it's it's probably the first. Uh, I see uh, direct impact. Uh, from the, uh, um, the the Israel Hamas war on on the region, and not necessarily in the long term or mid term, but actually in the short term. And what worries me the most is um, so I don't know if um, if you if you know this. A few weeks ago, um, Iran's supreme leader made a speech um, and said that there should be a disruption in the oil supply to Israel. And a few days later. The um, uh, head of Hezbollah, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, repeated uh, the same basically statement. Um, and to me, a primary audience of these statements is Azerbaijan, because it's a major oil supplier to uh, Israel. Um, and I can see this happening through different pathways. One could be uh, somehow uh, a bottom-up bottom uh, pressure, in Azerbaijan, like affecting the public opinion, um, or more importantly, potentially some groups who are loosely allied with Iran or Hezbollah, they could carry out some operations somewhere and try to disrupt this, the oil flow to, to Israel. And you all remember that it was a couple of years ago when 
um, some Iran-backed groups attacked the uh, oil facilities in, in Saudi Arabia and shut down 50% of Saudi's oil export within hours. So um, it could affect that very much so. And if something like this happens, um, of course, we don't know, you know to what extent Iran is involved or not involved, but in and of itself, I think that could uh, intensify the uh, the conflict and exacerbate, you know, the situation basically further uh, uh, the conflict between Iran and Azerbaijan. So uh, very much so. And as I said, for me, this is a short term concern uh, that could happen anytime. Okay, um, I'm going to combine the next question, although I, I mean, okay, so this is about uh, the immediate future, we had a question from YouTube. To what extent do you believe President Aliyev's declarations about, quote, returning to Western Azerbaijan suggest, end quote, suggest the possibility of an invasion of Armenia? And I'm uh, combining this with uh, a question from an anonymous attendee um, in the webinar. What do you think? What kind of reaction will follow if Azerbaijan annexes the territory that separates it from Nakhchivan? Um Will Russian troops be stationed there? What if the corridor is fully taken and controlled by Azerbaijan only? Would the West back this as an action that challenges Iran and Russia at the same time? Shall I take, shall I respond first to this one? Thanks, uh, Elise. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. If you hear people in Armenia talking, they basically expect Azerbaijan to invade tomorrow. And if you... Uh, hear people in Azerbaijan talking. They say, "What? What are you talking about?" Um, so there's a, there's obviously a, a bit of a disjunction there. Clearly, there's been you know, and this has this has been the case since 2020. A lot of threatening language from President Aliyev. The the use of Western Azerbaijan um, to talk about Armenia. This term, which you know sounds extremely irredentist. Um, his um, you know the fact that he does not use he does not basically um, directly recognize the territorial integrity of, of Armenia. He does in, in the way that Pashinyan does of Azerbaijan. Statements he's made about Zangazul Corridor, all of this you know, is extremely threatening. But I, to my mind, and I, I, I'm, I'm sitting in London, not in southern Armenia, this is all about coercion. And maybe we'll see, we, we might see some kind of use of violence um, on, on the border. But I think a full-scale invasion would be a completely different matter. I think you get you get strong pushback uh, at that point from the United States and the European Union. And more to the point, what would you do if you if you actually occupied southern Armenia and your objective was to build an international railway? Well, that would that's hardly uh, favorable conditions uh, to do so. I so I see it, I see it much more being a case of coercion of Armenia, you know, backed up. I would guess by both Russia and Turkey saying that that we want this corridor and we want it on our terms with this kind of threat of force which probably will not be applied but as I say I'm I'm the, I'm sitting in London uh, not in Armenia and I understand uh, that the Armenians have basically seen this kind of coercion over the last 3 years and are understandably quite afraid If I could uh, agree with Tom uh, first and uh, and say also, I certainly hope that the um, Azerbaijani forces don't invade because that would so that would make this so monstrously worse and it would really turn it into a wider potentially um, regional conflict. Um, but the intimidation use of these references to Western Azerbaijan, I think, is is possibly what's happening. And um Again, it might be a kind of echo, a kind of mirroring of what the Azerbaijanis saw in the late 80s, early 90s, because as the um, Armenian forces became more successful toward mountainous Karabakh and toward the rest of, of those areas, there was also discussion about taking uh, Nakhchivan by the Armenians because they had claimed that as well. And as I recall there was at least one, maybe two instances of shelling um, of Nakhchivan from Armenian positions. And so the Azerbaijanis might be genuinely making this claim. Um, I don't 
think it's likely they would act on it, at, at least not right away. But it may also be a sort of tit for tat kind of position. Well, you said this when you were on top. And so now we're going to say the same thing here. And I'm putting that in, in what is perhaps too elementary a fashion. And I do want to acknowledge that the Azerbaijanis and their diplomacy has become far more sophisticated than anything we saw in the 90s. And that has been a big advantage for them as well. Uh, Anna, you want to add on that? Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on that. And I think the uh, on a few points, uh, I think the Azerbaijani rhetoric, expansionist rhetoric, um, after Azerbaijan has been getting essentially the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh is an indication, I think it's the obvious point, that this conflict has stopped being about Nagorno-Karabakh for Azerbaijan a long time ago, that there are other drivers in Azerbaijani behavior. And again, it's the domestic unreformed state of Azerbaijani, uh, uh, Azerbaijan as a country uh, is the key factor, at least that I see it. If in regards to Armenia's Sunik region, quote unquote, Zangezur corridor, uh, if Azerbaijan did try, I, I think the more likely scenario, uh, similar to what's happening elsewhere in the world, and Turkey has been doing this military limited annexations in Syria, uh, buffer zones, etc. Uh, there's good scholarship that has demonstrated that while overall norms against conquest, territorial conquest, have been the strongest and have been crucial in protecting, maintaining world stability. By the way, norms that have originated from the beginning of the 20th century from the Latin American states, uh, that while those norms are still holding strong, there is an increase in limited military interventions, limited annexations, short of a total warfare. So if Azerbaijan did try even another, uh, the United States, retro, the, the response uh, to sort of the support Armenian territorial and integrity, the language has been, uh, it was interesting, very detailed, saying any kind of breach on Armenia's uh, territorial integrity uh, will generate a response. The Western response to the ethnic cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh in not involving essentially way, just Russia, the West, just watching as Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey backed Azerbaijan did the 2020 war. Part of it is because the, the language of territorial sovereignty, sort of the tyranny of territorial sovereignty has allowed that. So internationally, they could justify it that way. It's Azerbaijan's quote unquote internal affairs. But any attack on Armenia's borders, that's a whole different, different um ball game that would be an in that, that essentially would put Aliyev in the same category as Putin. And I do think that there will be much stronger response from the West uh, on Aliyev, and it would be a huge miscalculation on the side of uh, Aliyev. Would he do it? Uh, we have seen uh, powers, uh, political elites doing self-sabotage. I think we, <laughs> it's quite possible. But at the same time, particularly concerning considering the mobilization of the Muslim world as a result of the Hamas attack in Israel, right, the, the war in Israel, it does create uncertainties inside Azerbaijan. See the, the, the mobilization in Dagestan inside Russia. I realize that within Azerbaijan, religious components, religious groups have been suppressed, but at the same time, this would be a big unknown to start something on the border. And again, while Azerbaijani foreign policy is militarized, Azerbaijan is a weak rentier state. We declare declining oil reserves. And it is that domestic weakness that is driving the militarization. And I'll conclude simply saying that it is in this context that the Sunnic region, Armenian Sunnic region, which is what I wrote in the foreign policy article, will make or, or break the Western liberal rules-based connectivity of the Eurasian continent. I look at the Armenian Sunnic issue from the perspective of Eurasian continentalism, and if though, and I do think it is very much in Western interest, and as well as Iran's, in maintaining predictability, rules-based world order, rules-based connectivity in South Caucasus would be beneficial both to Iran as well as the West. And um, if we see things, depending how this is settled, I think it's a uh, Armenian Sunnic region is a good. A marker as to what's happening to the Western's ability in in supporting the rules based world order. Okay, we're we're running very short on time, and I want to be mindful of our panelists' time and thank them again for joining us here today. 
Um, but I do, there are a bunch of, and I want to thank, there, we got lots of questions in the Q&A. This is a very engaged audience. I want to ask, sort of bundle a bunch of questions together and ask our panelists for very concise answers, whoever wants to weigh in on this. But we have a bunch of different questions about Armenia's support going forward. And a, bun and a number of them sort of take the flavor of, can the West uh, and, and maybe other countries as well, such as India, replace the guarantee that the, the security guarantee for Armenia that the Russians used to provide to Armenia? And then there's a couple on the other side, which is like, is Russia really as out of the business of providing guarantees to Armenia as it looks at the moment? Um, I think we've talked a little bit more about that already, but just sort of if you might maybe add just, you know, since a lot of people were interested and in if we could close with just a couple you know, brief comments on that from anyone who, who wants to speak on that. I can yes. Talk. Okay, uh, we'll go Audrey and then Anna. And if I can ask you both to try to keep it under a minute, it would be great. Russia's prime foreign policy interest is Russia. Uh, if we look over the past century, two centuries, five centuries, when Russia is strong, Russia takes what it wants. Um, Russia has never been a dependable protector protector of Armenia, unless it's in Russian interests to do so. Um, but Russia cares about the Caucasus and power in the Caucasus, and that is a pathway to the Middle East. So there is not, to answer that question, there is not, as far as I can see, any other power that would take that position. Armenia is um, on its own, I think, without Russia, and um, has many um, tools at its disposal. Uh, but I would not I would not count on Russia. And I don't see anybody, especially not India, taking its place. Anna? Uh, I agree. Simply to say that when we think of deterrence and the argument that Russia was providing deterrence for Armenia, deterrence is as beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> the Russian quote unquote support for Armenia over the past decades. Uh, I would argue um, Azerbaijani uh, sort of waiting its time, though had a lot more to do with the oil prices being on the up um, than with Russia's push against Azerbaijan. Moving forward, I think the type of hard sort of security guarantees that Armenians say that Russia was providing, which it was not, Russia's support has been very costly for Armenian state. I think the world is not moving in that direction. No, very few states can count on that kind of hard security. What you see Armenia doing in ratifying the International Criminal Court, increasingly using international instruments of uh, human rights, increasingly diversifying security partnerships, you see a small state finally um, sort of coming out under Russia's influence, still very significant, Russian influence is still significant, but you see Armenia essentially diversifying its security arrangements through, through a variety of types of tools, and I think expecting that uh, any state would provide the type of hardcore um, support is unrealistic in the multipolar world order. And that security is not only strategic security, but the domestic security of institutions is as critical. OK, thank you so much, Anna. Tom, did you want to make a quick comment? A hand? OK, all right. We've hit we've hit 130. So I want to once again thank all of our audience for joining us here today. I want to thank our four panelists. This was extremely informative. I have so many notes that I need to go back and read over the notes so I can make sure that I understand what I what I think I had learned here. And I may reach out to some of you again in the future for this. This has been incredibly informative and timely. I want to also do a huge thank to Anton Shirkov, who has been uh, Shirkov, who has been helping us, so postdoc at Harriman, who has been helping us arrange all of these all year and did another incredible job helping put this together, this panel together today. I want to thank Eileen at the Harriman Institute for facilitating uh, these discussions here today. And I want to let all of you know that our next New York City Russia public policy uh, panel, the last of the fall semester, will be on December 13th. It will be at the same time at 12 Eastern, so we can have people from joining us from various time zones. Um, and it's going to be about public support for the war in Russia and trying to gauge public opinion in Russia and the challenges thereof around support for the war in Ukraine. So thank you all once again for joining us here today. Thanks for all those panelists. It's been incredibly interesting. So take care, everybody. And thanks thank you. to Elise Giuliano yeah, as well. Yeah, thank you. Great panel.